case of Canada, in the month of February. Good to see you tonight. We're going to do things just a little bit differently, as we've already seen. I appreciate all the prayers. Uh, one announcement that uh, you don't want to miss. Daylight savings time ends. Uh, so you get another extra hour of sleep unless you get mixed up and move your clock the wrong way. And then you will be here and nobody else will. But uh, wait on us, we'll get here. Okay? Actually, all, all the deacons, make sure you call your families and remind them of the uh, setting the clocks back. And also remind them that Sunday we'll be taking up uh, a family assistance fund. So, just a reminder. All right. We're going to look at a couple pieces of scripture tonight as we consider this upcoming election. Now, I'm sure several of you, maybe all of you, have already voted. and Maybe this is a little bit too late. But I'm going to tell you how to vote. Now, don't, don't get uneasy. Don't be easy, easy, easy. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to do that. But how to vote, and there's a big, big difference. That's right. Now, I want to tell you how to vote according to the scriptures. And as I said in the Sunday's bulletin, I will urge each of you to vote, but I will certainly never, ever tell you who to vote for. That's not my calling. That you're calling from the Lord. And I do not usurp his authority at all. So what does the Bible say about the election? About uh, elections in the general? Surprisingly, nothing specific. Now, why is that? You need to consider the times that the Bible was written. Because the times of Jesus, the Jews were under Roman rule. And they were not Roman citizens. And they were not permitted to vote. At that time, only the very wealthiest were able to vote at that time, so we could look at that. But do you recall an election in the Bible? Anybody? Well, you're very quiet tonight, and I know you all know the answer. You're just too embarrassed to speak up. Is this crowd's ever too embarrassed to speak up? I don't think so, are they? Let's talk about an election in Acts chapter 6. Turn to your Bibles, Acts chapter 6. We'll look at verse 1 through 5. Acts 6, 1. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek ye out from among you seven men of good report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the, and the saying blessed the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timion, Parmeus, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they sent before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. When you think about that, how different is our election from the election of the disciples in that time, the disciples that were there, the deacons. Seven men were there. They were to help protect the rights of the people, settle the dispute, if you will, between the Hellenistic Jews and the native Hebrews. What is it with our government today? What are they supposed to do? We think about that. Once elected, the politicians, and that's exactly what they are, they're in office, they're expected to safeguard our rights. That, that's what their purpose is. But one difference is that in the Bible days, the people elected men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and wisdom. Well, I think today, how's that today? How we think about today? Maybe today, many, maybe not all, but most of our politicians would have to look about their reputation. Is it good? How many in office, more importantly, whether they are even men and women who are full of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. In the election of 2012, Billy Graham began a campaign, he says, vote biblical values. And that's what I want to think a little bit about tonight. He encouraged people to vote for candidates who espouse biblical values and morality, and in his words, men and women full of the Spirit. So it should be for this election cycle and all elections as well. If you were to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, 
it talks about our duties and many duties that are there. But it's our duty as Christians and as citizens to participate in prayer. We've done that some tonight, and we need to continue to do that the remainder of this week and into the election. We need to pray for those who seek to gain power and to lead us. We're not only to pray, but we're also to vote. Now, I will admit, I'm taking a little bit out of context what I'm about to say from James chapter 5, or James chapter 2, uh, but this is from the New Living Translation. Re listen as I read this. So you are, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is deed and useless. It is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Now saying, if you will, that the Bible doesn't specifically say to vote, and it does not, I, I will admit that, because are you going to vote the scriptures? Uh, he says, show me your faith by your good deeds. Let me say it this way, from this. If we are to pray for our leaders, if we're to pray for the election results as God wants it to come out, and God wants it to do, we ought to be willing to vote for what we're praying for. We need to do that. We need to vote for our leaders, and we're to pray for them. Maybe this was a poor example, but I believe it is our Christian duty, if you will, to vote so we pray in faith and then go to work. In this instance, go vote. And with our votes, we can strive to elect godly men and women who will make laws that conform to biblical values. I'm grateful that I'm not called to be a politician. I wouldn't last very long anyway. Uh, and those of you who are very honest, you wouldn't last very long, any longer than I would. It just would not happen. We're not called to be political servants. The majority of us will never hold any political office, but we still have a very important role to play. We must begin with prayer and discernment. We must educate ourselves, if you will, on the stances of the candidates and vote accordingly. I don't have to tell you that this year's election is one of the most highly contested I can remember. It's not hard to see why people across America are, are disturbed or greatly divided. Look at the newspapers, listen to radio, watch television, anything you want to do. They all seem to have no problem telling you who you ought to vote for. They all seem to do that. Tempers are hot, emotions are high. But to me, this year's election seems more personal than any time in my lifetime. It's a very personal thing. Now, I'm not just talking about the national election. That's bad enough. But you can look at state and, to a certain degree, local elections as well. The consequences today doesn't seem as clear as they should be. But there's a start when we think about the contrast this year. By the way, one of the ways that God judges a nation is by giving them exactly what they ask for. We have to be careful what we ask for. How many times have I said that? Be careful what you ask for. You may get what you ask for and not like what you get what you get. And there's a lot of truth to that. We have to understand we need to vote biblical values. Now, it's important to understand that every person that goes to vote uses some type of criteria to determine who they're going to vote for. Now, hopefully, just don't go mark a ballot by chance, and I think some do that. Some, as always, vote according to party lines. A lot of them do that. Some people, it doesn't matter who's on a particular picket, they're going to vote for that individual if they're, on that, if they're on that ticket. It just does not matter for them. Others vote on who they think will benefit them the most. Still others vote on personal convictions. Some look for character. Some look for personality. Some will look for prejudices. My question tonight is, what criteria should a Christian use in determining who we should vote for? In other words, how should I vote? Well, as your pastor, I would suggest that the major criteria we should use in voting for a candidate is the criteria of stewardship. What's a steward? We all know that. We're not talking money at all here. But a steward is a person entrusted with the management of the affairs of others. That's what we do. That's what a steward, steward is. The Bible describes each believer as a steward of God. God has graciously given us the right to vote. 
we're to be good stewards of that boat. We must then ask a question, how can we be a good steward of the boat that God has given us? How many countries do you know that don't have the privilege of voting? We could name many, many of them. Many, many of them. Voting is a privilege, but it's also a duty of faithful Christians. Remember the old saying, to vote or not to vote, that is the question? Well, we're, that was really wasn't it, was it? It was close, but that's not it. It's easy to become cynical about the government, is it not? Now, let's be honest. Uh, you know, government. Uh, it just sometimes a, 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 a leaves a bad taste in your mouth when you start talking about it. But it's our contention that it is the duty and responsibility of every Christian to vote, to vote for leaders who promote Christian principles. God is most certainly in control. God is in control. I believe God will control the outcome if God's people will pray and vote. God's people need to pray and vote. I believe that with all my heart. God does tells us that it's our privilege, it's our responsibility, but we have to do everything we can to determine his, his will. You know, if you read 1 Timothy, we're commended to pray for our leaders, regardless of whether we agree with who they are, what they stand for or not. And that is hard. What does he tell us? Pray for our enemies. That, folks, that's hard, is it not? It's very hard, but we need to do that. You know, the evidence of sin's grip on this world is everywhere. I believe much of the suffering that this world's going through now, even right here, some in America, is because of godless leadership. Scripture gives Christians instructions to obey legitimate authority if it does not contradict the Lord's command. As born-again believers, we ought to strive to choose leaders who will by themselves be led by our great creator, God. Candidates, we think about that, or proposals that violate violate the Bible's command for life, family, and health should never be supported by our votes and our resources. Christians could vote, if you will, as led through prayer and study of both God's word and the realities of the choices that they make. Go vote. Don't stay home. Don't forget. Let's not shirk our responsibility. Don't get mad. Well, there's just nobody good to vote for. I, I may agree with you on that. But you know, you probably got to go vote anyway. Sometimes you vote for the lesser instead of the, be instead of the best. I understand that. But we vote as we're led through prayer and study of ballot. We have to understand how many people have fought and died for our right to do what we're about to do. Think about that. Think about those whose blood was spilled on foreign battlefields because of the fact that they wanted this country to be free. As long as we're free, we will have the right to vote. The day that we cease to be free, we will lose our vote. It's not our vote. It's not our right. It's our responsibility. Our vote should be determined by biblical principles. Maybe I should say by God's values. Now, I hesitated to do what I'm about to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to tell you how I vote. I'm not going to tell you who I vote for, but I'll tell you how I vote. I vote for the most pro-life candidates that there are around. And I do that because God values human life. From the moment of conception, God values that human life. I also vote for the most pro-Israel. God tells us. He said, I'm going to bless those who bless you, bless Israel, and curse those who do not. I also vote for the candidate who most closely believes government's purpose is to reward the good and punish evil. I vote based as close as I can on God's word. Knowing whoever gets elected, God is the one that puts all men in authority, and women as well. Now let me tell you, I want to challenge you to close with one, one simple thing. Don't vote for a party. Vote for an individual. And when you vote for a person, examine their values, their beliefs, and their care, and their core principles. I promise you one thing. You and I can listen to the very same political speech. All of us will come away with a different understanding of what they said. 
we do that because we have sometimes preconceived notions of what we want them to say. Let me close with this. Next Wednesday, I guarantee you, some are going to be very happy. Some are going to be very upset. I, I, I know that. I know that beyond any shadow of a doubt. But regardless of whether Biden or Trump win the presidency, whether McGrath or McConnell win the Senate, whether the local leaders that you voted for win or lose, it doesn't matter. You're going to be upset if your candidate doesn't win. But let me tell you what we're going to do next Wednesday. We're going to pray for the president, whoever he is. We're going to pray for the senator, whoever he or she is. We're going to pray for local elected officials, whoever they happen to be. Why are we going to do that? Because God tells us to lift up those that are in authority. And folks, you and I may not be able to change anything that they do. But let me tell you what, God can. God can. You and I will pray and lift them up. Okay? Okay. All right. Let's, let's stand and we'll close in prayer. Now, Father and our God, we're grateful for the country you allow us to live in. Thank you for America, Father. We know it's not a perfect union by any stretch of the imagination. But, Father, it's the best place that I would ever want to live. No place else on this earth to live than other than where I am right now. And Father, as we come to this very critical time, a time that we have every four years, a time, Father, to elect who's going to lead this nation, who's going to serve in the Congress, the House of Representatives. Father, it's my prayer that each of us would seek your faith, seek your guidance in how we vote. Not only for us who are members of this church and here tonight, but for God's people everywhere. Father, I lift up these that are running. I pray, Father, for them. I pray, Father, that you'd put a hedge of protection around each of them. And Father, I just pray that as we vote and as the nation votes, and the votes are tabulated, thy will be done. Father, we'll give you the praise for what you do during this election in Jesus' name.